Well, uh, 1966, here we go again. I've been listening to Kent Kruger. Uh, I love his voice, you know, I don't care what he says. <laughs> I just like listening to it, okay? So I'm going to put my voice on here now for a while, all right? It's very hot here again. I had an audition today for a voiceover as a rough old voice. <clears throat> so there's a chance I might get that. So I love doing voiceovers because I was brought up on radio and I love acting with my voice on a radio. But, uh, you know, there's not much uh, call for that these days. But now and again, you get a voiceover audition. Yeah, 1966. All right, we're going back in time. Uh, inspired by the artist in our house, uh, I created sculpture out of junk, street junk. My first piece was an empty milk carton uh, made of cardboard and a potato that tentrils grew out of. You leave a potato on the desk for long enough, all tentrils will start to grow out of it. So I gave it the title Living Still Life and I went to show it off at the Piccolo Bar. The Piccolo Bar was a coffee shop, the most popular beatnik coffee shop back then. It had been going since the 50s. And uh, long-haired Billy came out of Wallace House. That was Wallace House was another run-down private hotel where you could get a cheap room. Didn't even have a tap in the room. You had to go to the uh, communal bathroom to... But, you know, it was a place to crash. Because uh, you live on the street in those days, the coppers would come and arrest you for vagrancy because uh, everybody had a job if they wanted one. So there was no reason to live as a vagrant in the uh, in 66 and even up until 1972. King's Cross was crowded even at 1am on a Sunday. It was like uh, Philadelphia is today, parts of Philadelphia. Uh, a gorgeous dark-haired, oh, I won't go into that, this gorgeous dark-haired chick that I, I thought was beautiful, uh, but I'm not going to talk about her at the moment. I said to long-haired Billy, man, that chick flips my wig, but I think she digs musos. So I'm going to learn guitar just to get with her. Do you reckon she's mod or hippie? And he said, she's both, I reckon, like a rocker mixed with a hippie. There were all sorts of labels in those days. <laughs> And I looked in the Aristocrat Cafe. That was another hippie sort of cafe in King's Cross. And I saw Alan Spencer, the sharpest dressed womanizer in town, who treated girls poorly. We waved to him, but he was working on a girl he was talking to. So he died of cancer in 2011. And all the girls rejoiced. All the girls that he'd treated badly rejoiced. <laughs> and had a party. Uh, near Lay Girls Cabaret was the Studio 5. It was full of Sharpies. They were like uh, well-dressed rockers. And a drag queen ca called Aisha. She's on the internet somewhere. Uh, and I said to Billy, gee, what, drag queens have guts. To dress like a chick takes balls. Because in 1966, they could get arrested for wear and drag in public. Arriving in Long Bay Jail in a tight satin miniskirt was the most horrifying occurrence I could imagine. They could be raped and teased, and most of the guards would think it was funny. So I said, yeah, fags and drag queens, they're the real rebels. Compared to them, we're square. I walked into the piccolo bar... It was like rolling dice. It had six tables. I saw Les Robinson, an Aussie middle-aged alcoholic hip cat. We'd shared quite a few floors of houses, but this week he had a lovely teenage girl on his arm and 
Instead of camping on someone's carpet, he'd rented a flat in Woomera Avenue. Uh, he jumped to his feet and knocked over someone's coffee, but he threw coins at them to placate them. And he said, Kaz, you've got to come see my new pad. There's always floor space for you, baby. Get yourself a coffee. <clears throat> Let us knew people in every city. Later, he'd guide me through a maze of Melbourne back alleys to visit Melbourne people. Uh, there was a guy there called Cliff Richards. That's not the pop singer, of course, but this Cliff Richards, he was really old, about 60, and was an encyclopedia of Bohemia. And three months later, I saw Les in an Adelaide jazz cellar where he bragged so much about the, the Sydney scene that two Adelaide folk drove us to Sydney to prove it. See, I was insanely happy being with all these beatnik types. I thought I'd arrived in heaven. Uh, but mostly I was playing a character. I wanted to be Mr. Cool, the beatnik Mr. Cool, you know. And I, I never took drugs in my life, but I always looked as if I was out, out of it, like this. And people thought that I was on drugs. In fact, everybody thought that I was on drugs. <laughs> but I'd never even had a joint uh, because I had this act that I was putting on, really, of being Mr. Cool that I got from Mad Magazine and from Jack Kerouac books. But, you know, eventually you act like something for long enough, you do become the thing that you're acting. <laughs> uh, Les was always in corduroy trousers and a roll neck pullover and he had a well-groomed goatee and a Parisian-style black beret and Black Alan Morawalla Morawara. Black Alan Moriwalla Morawalla was sitting there. Black, Black Alan was an Aboriginal. He was the only Aboriginal hippie. I oh, know there were two others at the time, but there weren't many Aboriginal people in the hippie scene. Uh, uh, Black Alan, yeah, yeah, he was singing, There's a house in Willamaloo, they call the rising sun. Yeah, and he changed all the words to make him Australian-like. And his acoustic guitar made like Hendrix, and his eyes caressed Les's girl. Les Robinson was sure that his chick would be faithful, at least for tonight. Jealousy was not cool. Trying to steal your pal's girl was a tradition amongst us that we men said gave women freedom of choice. Alan was called Black Alan to differentiate from the three other Alans in our circle. Perpetually smiling and confident, he'd come from the West Australian desert to flirt with little white lubras. That lubra is a, a w Aboriginal word for girl. He'd come to flirt with little white lubras and he was very successful. He was the first Aboriginal I'd met who didn't look as if he'd like to punch me. Perpetually nervous little Africa with a guitar joined in on a Dylan song. Alan and little Africa hoped to get a band started, but they were too busy jamming to ever organise. <clears throat> they just kept looking out for head musicians. A head described anyone with an unconventional outlook, but by 1967 it, it, it had evolved into meaning anyone who loves pot. Little Africa was a white kid and he resembled a bird that had seen too many cats. He was small and thin and he loved methadrine, the white stimulant tablets that gave more mystical energy and elation than anyone could ever imagine that hasn't experienced it. And they used to allow me to jump in with a dozen notes from Maria. 
I am a girl called Maria. The only thing I could play on my $2 plastic flute. They used to flip with delight. <laughs> At the dada insanity of Maria hopping into their arrangement, little Dick was at table three of the piccolo bar and he spoke in the softest voice and one had to listen very intently. He read Buddhism and his mutters were rare. He had a reputation of wise holy man and word went out, little Dick's about to speak. People leaned in close to hear enlightenment. But the only thing I ever heard was, Americans rave on about Boston beans. Why do they not dig San Francisco beans? He would soon leave King's Cross and create communal settlements around the town of Nimbin in northern New South Wales that became the hippie capital of Australia in a couple of years it was not easy for a male newcomer to get floor space in a hippie house. You had to be cool and be seen around for about four months. They had to trust you before they let you touch their record player. But if you were a girl, you need only hang around for an hour and be pretty or strange. There were three males to every female, so... A guy had to work real hard to get paired up. Hippies could unload freight at the railway yard if they needed money, and there were dozens uh, of jobs available if you wanted them, but uh, a lot of people didn't want jobs. One day at the Royal George Hippie Pub, a guy came in and said, anyone want work? You'll get what would be nowadays 500 bucks for a few hours' work. It was already 2pm, so six of us hopped in a truck and were driven to Kernel Beach and we were given wire brushes and detergent and told to clean the floor foreshore of oil tanker spillage. The driver left. There was no one in charge and we're the only ones on the beach. After scrubbing slightly oiled rocks for 20 minutes, I said, hey, this might be a practical joke. We scrub our ass off all day and no one turns up to pay us. And back at the pub, everyone's pissing themselves, laughing at us. And a few other guys had been thinking the same thing. But a bloke said, Oh, ye of little faith, I've done this before. It's fair dinkum, so scrub your rocks and get rich. Uh, at seven o'clock, the truck returned and we were paid our massive money. 400 bucks, I think it was, in nowadays dough. And that was good money uh, back then. That was two weeks, two or three weeks rent on a single room. And we even got driven back to the Royal George pub. Around the suburbs were hundreds of factories with unskilled work available. I worked in about 15. At Gold Ring gramophones, I packed record player needles. And because I was a little bit idealistic, I only stole five. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm working through this autobiography. Some of it's good and some of it's bad, so you'll have to bear with me. I'll come to some good bits soon, but that's enough for today. Yeah, I don't want to put too much dross on here. No, that could be boring. But then, then again, you don't have to listen to it, so I don't give a shit. All right, well, that's all for now.